Hello, welcome. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to Inspire Ambition Purposeful Business. Uh, my name is Chris Woodfield. Really excited to be here. There's people joining all the time. So welcome. Hope the sun is shining where you are. Um, it's a beautiful day here. So yeah, really excited for today's event. Um, so make yourself at home, uh, make yourself comfortable. Um, it'd be great to see some faces. Um, if you're able to keep your cameras, to keep your cameras on, that'd be fantastic. Just to see some, some eyes and some smiley faces, but welcome. Um, as I said, my name's Chris. I work on the low carbon Devon project here at the university of Plymouth, and I'm going to be the facilitator or host for today's event. So really excited to welcome you. Um, I'll just do a little intro as, as people are arriving and, and settling in, there's people joining all the time. But really just grateful to see some, some new faces as well in the audience. Um, just looking through the attendee list, there's lots of new names for us. So that's really exciting. Um, there's also some familiar ones as well. So yeah, just a big welcome. Um, we've got four lovely people lined up to come and speak to you today. And then we're going to have a Q&A after. So I'll just run through the plan for the session and, and then we'll dive in. Um, and I'll just give you a brief overview of Low Carbon Devon, who, who we are and what we're about as well. But to start off, just to, just to reconfirm, really, today's event is being recorded um, so we can share it with people. Um, I've already had a few requests for people who can't make it. So just to let you know it's being recorded. And as I said, it'd be great to have some cameras on so we can see everyone and engage in that way. Um, also to let you know, if you're able to stay on mute, just so we can have a smooth and comfortable experience for everyone, that'd be awesome and, and really much appreciated. There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end um, as well. So do think of some questions as our speakers are speaking. And do put your questions in the chat as we're going along. But for, but for now, what would be great if, if you could put who you are maybe in, in the chat and what organization you're representing, just so we can get a feel for who's in the room. That, that would be absolutely awesome. Um, so yeah, just put where you're from, where you're based, maybe who you're representing, just so the speakers, but also other audience members can get a feel of who's here. Um, so that's a bit of housekeeping, but yeah, really excited to dive in. So today's event is, is Inspire Ambition, Purposeful Business, and it's part of a series of events here at Low Carbon Devon, which we're really excited to, to deliver with you. Um, we're really excited to put these on. And these are a series of events aimed at sort of exploring what a low carbon Devon or what a low carbon future might look like. How can we sort of put that into action? How can we inspire that action? And that's positive, sustainable and regenerative change that we're aiming to seek. So we're exploring systems change, bold, ambitious change. And today you're gonna to hear from some people working directly, directly on that. Um, and they're gonna be sharing some insights, some lessons learned. Um, they're gonna be sharing some barriers as well and some obstacles to implementing that low carbon future. So hopefully it's gonna be insight, an insightful conversation and discussion. And Low Carbon Devon as a whole is about supporting enterprises in Devon to take action on climate change and trying to empower that positive change. So we are a project here at the university based within the Sustainable Earth Institute which is focused around research, collaboration, and impact. So we're an interdisciplinary institute focused on bringing together people to explore that positive change. And that really goes complements the Low Carbon Devon project. Low Carbon Devon has a number of different avenues to it. Um, and I'm not gonna go into all of those today, but just to, to give you a flavor and to say that we are here to work with local companies, um, we have an internship scheme called Future Shift. We have a number of research fellows working on different aspects, energy efficiency in building, green walls, living wall systems, power electronics, and the creative industries. 
So we're a broad project focused around exploring and supporting enterprises on their journey to net zero. And that could be enterprises at a whole host of different sectors, but also on different paths. So it could be enterprises who are already taking action on climate change, or you could be right at the start of your journey. We're here, we're here, we're flexible, we're adaptable, and we'd really love to work with you um, on your journey. So that's just a brief overview of who we are. But today's event, as I said, it's Inspire Ambition, Purposeful Business. And we're going to explore what does purposeful business look like? How can we deliver that purposeful business? And how can we sort of explore that together, but also overcome those barriers and challenges to together in a solutions focused way? So at this point, I'd just love to bring on the four speakers just to say hello and, and introduce them if we're able to bring them on together. So we have um, Chris Hines, we have Lindsay Hawkin, uh, Scott James and Debbie Luffman. But it'd be great just to hear from each of you, just a little bit about, just a brief overview of, of where you're based, um, who you're representing. And maybe if you could just share um, with us maybe one um, outdoor or nature experience that you've had this week, which you've enjoyed. Um, Debbie, maybe we could start with you. Yeah, no problem. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to be here at this event. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Debbie Luffman. I'm the product director at Finisterre. Um, Finisterre is an outdoor clothing company. If you don't know us, we're based down in Cornwall. Um, we make a sustainable outdoor clothing for men and women that are particularly um, passionate about the sea, um, like ourselves. Um, and an outdoor experience that I've, that I've I've had this week is that what you just said? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, um, I think just Cornwall in all its ridiculousness from weather weather point of view. I, I went for a run. We have a thing at Finisterre called Sea Tuesday, um, where you have to be in or or by the sea for an hour before you start work on the Tuesday. Um, so I set off yesterday morning, put my trainers on for a run around the coast and it was a beautiful sunny morning. And then halfway as I went around the corner, it was the classic Cornish mist descended, couldn't see anything. And by the time I got home, it was raining. Um, never, never such a bad, no, you can never have a bad run and no such a thing as bad weather as we all know. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Debbie. Um, maybe hand over to Scott. Hi everyone, uh, Scott James from Wall Williams Associates. Uh, like Debbie, uh, I'm also based down in Cornwall. Uh, we've got offices across uh, Plymouth and Exeter as well, so we kind of straddle a bit of both. Um, we're construction consultants at Anna B Corp, which I'll talk a little bit more on in, in just a bit. Uh, in terms of outdoor, less of the running, I'm, my, my aching bones kind of uh, hurt too much for that, but more miles on the bike. So. Again, coastal routes for me um, on the road bike or getting away from it out into the kind of mining landscape nearby on the trails on the mountain bike. So all good fun in the outdoors. And it's sunny today as well. So I'll be out doing that later on as well. Oh, good to hear. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, Lindsay, over to you. Hey, super nice to be here. So I'm Lindsay. I'm the co-founder of a creative agency called Protect Blue. We are ridiculously niche in that we only really work on ocean projects. Um, and yeah, I'm based in Jersey in the Channel Islands. So I feel like I'm the only non-mainlander on this call today. Um, and yeah, I found a sneaky little window today uh, in between calls to go for a swim in the sea. So yeah, that was my uh, happy moment of the day. Oh, lovely. Sounds really nice. Cool. Thanks, Lindsay and, and Chris. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Hines. Um, I have an organisation called A Grain of Sand, which is I help try and stimulate, I guess, uh, a little bit of like a, like a, a, a pearl, a little bit of grit of sand, and then out, hopefully a bit of an irritant and out comes something beautiful. Um, and picking up on Lindsay's little point there, I think, no, we're all not part of the mainland, and that was a big mistake. So <laughs> that's just a little political one. My... Uh, Two foxes on one walk the other day, saw two foxes. And then last night in the sea, saw this young kid have a brilliant wave. So that's me. Great. Cool. 
Oh, thanks for sharing that little insight. Um, awesome. So we'll be hearing from, from everyone in, in more detail. Um, so do think of some questions as our speakers are speaking. Um, we're going to go straight into the, into the first speaker in a second. And we'll take all of the questions at the end of after the final speaker has spoken. So, but do put your questions in the chat. Um, but yeah, first up, um, over to you, Lindsay. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, let me just share my screen. You guys all see that okay? So yeah, as I said, uh, co-founder of Protect Blue. This is not Jersey, by the way. <laughs> those fish are not, we're not, climate change hasn't gotten that bad that those fish are in Jersey. Um, but yeah, really excited to be here and, um, and share a little bit more about what we do um, as, a, as a company. And so I'm just gonna give you, yeah, an overview of kind of the four areas that we work in and then um, speak to some of the ways that we help organizations become more purposeful. Um, and so my role within the agency is strategy. Um, and for me, that's really about helping people answer tricky questions um, in innovative ways. And, um, and I think, you know, a lot of the organizations we work with, we work with lots of B Corps, we work with lots of um, like, co like ocean conservation groups um, and quite a lot of grassroots, so really small uh, ocean activists, which is really, really fun. And I think, part of what we do in our role is to take some of the commercial skill sets we've got, so whether that's strategy or storytelling or comms, um, and put those tools into good use for ocean activists. So one of the things that we've noticed over the years is that there's an incredible amount of really enthusiastic, passionate uh, ocean activists out there doing phenomenal work, um, but sometimes they're not having the impact that they wanna have in their project or in their community. And that is never down to a lack of enthusiasm or even a lack of um, education in the space they're working in. But quite often it comes down to some really simple um, tools that they haven't been able to plug into. So whether that is learning how to tell their story, learning how to measure their impact, um, learning how to position their brand, um, all of those kind of things connect with the right people raise funds and so we we run a couple of programs where we help ocean activists through those um those processes and i guess one of the useful things for you guys to know is that yeah everything we do predominantly is outside so we we say that nature is our co-facilitator so when we do brand strategy um we we've taken a process that is normally done in boardrooms um and well lots of screens right now and uh and we've taken it outdoors so what that normally looks like um in the days when we could travel a bit more we would uh, take our clients normally hiking or paddle boarding or a blend of both uh for two or three days and do all of their strategy outside because we believe that's where people are most creative um and so yeah we kind of remove everyone from their screens and, uh, and, and run them through the process outdoors. And as we're doing that, my business partner is a filmmaker, so he's filming the whole thing. So we end up with lots of lovely content for the brand or the organization. And the interesting thing for us um, in so much of COVID is we, we kind of got to this point where we were like, oh God, what are we gonna do? We're gonna have to do all this on screens. And, uh, and we made it quite a, uh, a tricky decision that we, we would not uh, go down the, the Zoom route and instead, we would try and facilitate uh, remote, um, remote hiking, remote uh, audio only hiking. So I'll explain what that means. It means that when we do, and I literally had one yesterday. So what that means is when we have clients so at the moment, we're working with a really lovely team in the Azores. So each of their team plugs into Zoom audio only. Sometimes we turn on for a second just to show each other where we are. We're all outside. We're all hiking at the same time so it's kind of like remote distributed hiking um, and we do our strategy sessions like that and although as I'm sure you can imagine logistically it is much trickier than sitting in front of a computer and taking notes I'm normally scribbling frantically the whole way through um, but it has been a phenomenal experience over the last 18 months to work through that process with a whole bunch of different organizations and um, and see what comes out of it and some of the conversations that happen um, and the ideas that come from people just being stepped out and into nature so that's our strategy side um, and then the three other areas that we work in so um, my business partner Luke is a former Royal Marine 
Um, and so we do quite a lot of expedition work. Um, and the latest one that we've been working on, slightly delayed with COVID, but is a return to Pitcairn Island. So not sure if anyone here is like a Mutiny on the Bounty fan, uh, but the Pitcairn Islands are uh, some of the most remote islands in the world. And interestingly, Henderson Island, which is not doesn't have a population on it, but it has the highest density of plastic pollution in the world. And so in 2019, uh, Luke and another bootneck of a uh, friend of his, who's also a filmmaker, they led an expedition to Pitcairn where they took a whole load of um, scientists and artists um, to Pitcairn to go to Henderson and remove the plastic from the island. And so uh, we are in, in, the, in the middle of um, planning the second expedition back there um, to do storytelling. So part of that role was working for Blue Belt. So the UK's government's um, Blue Belt program, which is all around marine protected areas, They're doing loads of work in the overseas territories. And so we were building a media archive for Blue Belt. And then at the same time, actually kind of leading the safety on the on the expedition as well. So that is it, it was supposed to happen at the end of this year. We're looking probably towards the end of next year now to go back. But that's super exciting. Um, the other thing we do is education. So I think um, especially in the space that we work in, all too often people use too much jargon and overcomplicated language. And so what we try and do is translate climate science, ocean literacy into language that people understand. And um, that can be education for kids. So we've got our own curriculum called Cloud and Dirt, um, but also we do loads of education for um, other organizations and kind of run workshops and that sort of thing. And then the last kind of piece of the puzzle for us is around storytelling. So uh, making films, um, creating podcasts, all that kind of stuff for brands and organizations. So, um, and this is this is kind of just what I wanted to share a little bit about um, in in how we work with with organizations in terms of their sustainability. We look at it in two two spaces, one internally and one externally. So for us internally is about cleaning up your side of the streets. Um, you're going to hear from amazing B Corps here. So they're going to go into way more detail. But um, I was really lucky to be in the first cohort uh, of the B Leaders program that B um, Lab UK ran. And so, um, and I did it as more of a knowledge uh, mission rather than wanting to become a, a B Corp consultant. I just wanted to learn way more about the B Corp process. And so we've been really lucky to work with lots of different organizations. And this is the, the big thing, right? Is you have to clean up your side of the street. And when we look at the reasons for why you should do that, I kind of always come back to this top one of like, it, it, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> you know, I, I'd quite like to just cross all the rest off and be like, you should just be doing it. But anyway, um, it is the right thing to do. It's the, the time is now to be doing it. Um, and I think we actually did a, a workshop this week where we were taking a team through some climate science and again, translating it into plain English. And, um, and I pulled some news articles just from the last few weeks of things that have happened in the world around climate change. And it was sort of horrifying to look at this one slide with maybe six or seven different stories. And as I was looking at it and I was looking at the, you know, the explosion in the Gulf of Mexico and, and the wildfires in Canada and the sewage stuff that we've just been talking about in the UK. Um, and it was like, when is this enough information <laughs> for people to start taking this seriously? So that's that's that first point. Um, the second point is that consumers are asking for it, right? People are more conscious and more educated than ever. I don't think uh, I don't think we can get away with greenwashing anymore. Thank goodness, um, and that that's a really that's a really great thing as far as I can see. And then also remembering that you know brands organizations are made of people, and people care about things. And and what we're finding now, and there's loads of research to show that 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 people entering the job market want to work for organizations who care and who are doing something about this and so it's about attracting and retaining talent um, and and enabling people to feel like they're making an impact in the work that they do I think um, we've done quite a lot of work in the ocean plastic space and there's a lot that I feel like climate can learn from that because there's just been some really tangible actions that people can take and climate on the other hand can feel a little bit a bit overwhelming um but you know what if you get to work for a, for a company i'm going to use finisterre as an example but if you get to work for a company like finisterre then you know that even just showing up and doing your job every day you're actually making a difference so i think that's a really nice way to look at it and then the last bit on on this side is around legislation you know things are changing and 
for the better, thank goodness. Um, I had a, a call with Kate from B Corp this week and we were talking about the Better Business Act and, and where things are going um, in the UK and, and trying to change legislation so that we move towards a more triple bottom line um, business model. And so, you know, as a business, it's like, if you're not doing this already, it, the legislation is going to catch up and, and you'll end up being behind. Um, and then on the flip side, looking at it from an external point of view, um, and the way we look at that is like making a dent in something like what is it? What's the cause that you want to make a dent in? What um, what problem are you trying to solve? Where do you want to have an impact? And so that's about choosing and supporting a cause. Um, I'm really I'm really passionate about helping brands choose the right cause. I think quite often people jump on a bandwagon. Um, I was asked to do um, to be on a panel last year. Uh, so I'm based in Jersey and, and for good or bad, uh, a lot of our industry is just about money here. <laughs> so I was asked to be on a panel full of, I was the only non-trust company person. And it was really interesting because all these bankers and trust company folk were really excited to tell me about their beach cleans um, because I'm, I, I also founded Plastic Free Jersey. So part of the Surfs Against Sewage um, program around getting plastic off our beaches. And everyone was desperate to tell me about their beach cleans and what their company was doing. And although that is super impressive, I sort of pushed back a little bit and I was like, it made, it made sense. There was one in the room where I'm like, it makes sense for Bank of Canada because Bank of Canada have always been about water, but the rest of you have just kind of jumped on this ocean plastic thing. And I don't know that it aligns with your brand. And so it's great that you're doing beach cleans, but maybe your CSR and your marketing team should actually talk to each other and align and, and not keep them as two separate things. Um, the other thing is driving innovation in your industry. So shifting the models of capitalism and saying, hey, we're learning these things and we're gonna share this with everyone else in our industry so the whole industry can move forwards, which is huge. And then the last piece for me is around educating your audience is that if you've got a business, you've got people you can talk to and there's an amazing opportunity for you um, to educate them and inspire them and empower them to take climate action. And I guess one of the examples that, um, actually, I'm going to go back because otherwise you'll get stuck with that quote. I'm going to finish with that quote. Um, one of the examples that I love is we did some work uh, last year with Parlay for the Oceans and, um, and they partnered with Corona. And what I've always found with Corona is, you know, they chose to, to partner with Parley. So they did a good job in that they partnered with a good organization who are doing great work. But when I think about the impact that Corona are having in the ocean plastic space, it's less about the amount of beach cleans that they're running, although they're doing loads. And it's more the fact that they have plugged in this huge audience they have and started to educate them and make, you know, keeping our beaches and our ocean clean cool for their audience and for me that that's a massive opportunity for brands to recognize and quite often we work with companies and they'll say oh our, we're not sure how much our audience knows about climate change or keeping the ocean clean and they almost see that as a barrier but I think for us we see that as a as a really great opportunity um so yeah I thought I'd give you like an overview just so you get a, a sense of some of the stuff that we've been doing recently um so almost a month ago, more than a month ago, yeah. Uh, we were working with Finisterre to um, design and produce C7, which was an online um, ocean activist training camp. Really, really fun day full of amazing speakers, really giving people the tools and the conversations to talk about what we need to do to protect our ocean. Uh, in the same week, we were also running World Ocean Day for Schools, which is a really good program run by a collective called We Are Ocean. Um, we've also just been working with the We Are Ocean Collective to build out a communication framework for ocean literacy. So how to talk about the ocean ways that that connect us more meaningful, meaningfully. Um, right now, as in just before this call, um, we are doing some work in Iceland with a vodka company called Reka, uh, and we are helping them with their sustainability approach and looking at uh, really exciting blue carbon projects on the ground there. So kelp farms and all that good stuff. And um, and yeah, that's that. I guess that gives you an overview really for the sorts of things we do. I am going to finish with this quote because it is one of my favorites. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm finishing with this is because one thing that I think can happen a lot is if you work in the climate space or um, in the ocean space, it can get a bit overwhelming <laughs> and you can spend a lot of time doing the work and you can almost forget uh, the real reason why you're doing it. And so, yeah, this is from Edward Abbey. Um, one final paragraph of advice, do not burn yourselves out. Be as I am, a reluctant enthusiast, a part-time crusader, a half-hearted fanatic. 
Save the other half of yourselves and your lives for pleasure and adventure. It is not enough to fight for the land. It is even more important to enjoy it while well, you can, while well, it's still here. So get out there and hunt and fish and mess around with your friends, ramble out yonder and explore the forests, climb the mountains, bag the peaks, run the rivers, breathe deep of that yet sweet and lucid air. Sit quietly for a while and contemplate the precious stillness, the lovely, mysterious and awesome space. Enjoy yourselves, keep your brain in your head and your head firmly attached to the body, the body active and alive, and I promise you this. I promise you this one sweet victory over our enemies, over those desk bound men and women with their hearts in a safe deposit box and their eyes hypnotized by desk calculators. I promise you this, you will outlive the bastards. Thanks guys. <laughs> awesome, thanks Lindsay. Um, great overview and yeah, some great things you, you mentioned there. So I'd be keen to delve into detail in, in the discussion after particularly around sort of seeing barriers as opportunities. Um, so yeah, awesome, thank you. Um, I think we'll flow straight into the next speaker, which is Scott, um, Scott James. Over to you, Scott. Oh yeah, thanks Chris, thanks very much. And not, nice one, Lindsay. There's a really good segue there about outliving the bastards with desk calculators and you're passing across to quantity surveyors. So really good link, <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, really, really enjoy that. Very inspiring. And um, I think what, what I'll really come on to now is perhaps a little bit more of the um, translating that into how we deliver our business in, in terms of our approach to sustainability and uh, net zero in particular. And I'm going to do the thing of sharing my screen. Let's see if this almost certainly will fail, but let's give it a go anyway. How is everybody doing with that? Is it starting to work? Just some thumbs up would be great or something. Yeah, yeah. All, all good, Scott. Ryan. Okay, great stuff. So, yeah, thanks very much for having me. Really is a pleasure. I'm uh, based uh, in Cornwall, where we put uh, the jam first, cream on top. My colleague told me to say that, so I just wanted to make sure I'd get that out in the open, being up front and frank with you all. Uh, we do have offices in Plymouth and Exeter as well. Um, some great offices in the, in the, in the southwest, uh, over 46 years in practice and seven offices. We're growing like Dad's Army's arrows out from the west to the east and north. So we go as far as London up to Manchester uh, as, as well. So what we do, we're construction consultants, but that covers cost management, uh, project management, sustainability, work with designers and so on. So anything to do with the built environment and natural environment that needs project kind of coordination, that, that's our thing. And one of our favorite recent projects, which Chris, one of the co-speakers today, has been involved in for many years, which we've delivered recently, is the one on the image there, which is the WAVE project up in Bristol, which is a, a fantastic asset for those in and around Bristol and that region that perhaps can't get to the coast as easily as us lucky sods down in, in, in the southwest. Uh, in, in Devon, we've worked on some pro projects recently, like the box in Plymouth, uh, Royal William Yard and so on. So some really, really cool projects uh, uh, across the region. But that's what we do. But what we are is, is a little bit different to that, how, how we're kind of our, our makeup, if you like. And it's about really putting sustainability first. And that's both the, the net zero side of things. Or oh, I'll flip back. That's both the net zero side of things, but also sustainability across the triple bottom line about our, our people and about the communities that we work in as well. And the way in which we've sought to kind of capture that, that, that Lindsay referred to and, and also um, the team will talk about a little bit later on as well, is uh, through the kind of B Corp process, which looks to capture all of those different areas. And I'll talk a little bit about that before then talking about uh, what we're doing specifically uh, as a business. So what is a B Corp? Um, I noticed on the, on the uh, attendee list, there's uh, Kyle from B Corporation is actually on, on, on the call as well today. So it's, it's great to see. But it's something that captures the entire social environmental performance of, of a business. It looks at the holistic picture. It's not like some of the other kind of ISO accreditations or perhaps investors in people on the people side that have been put in place previously. It's about the holistic lot, right from the small micro businesses through to the global businesses. And I think that's really important, a really independent measure of what your business is like, how you're performing across that whole process and a very transparent way of doing that. But the really important thing for us at WWA is that actually it gives us a real target for the future about how we seek to improve. So we may be doing some things well, but how can we get better and, and work um, in an enhanced way across, across other areas? 
So some of those businesses, um, we've obviously got Finster speaking today, everybody's favourite. Um, we've we spent half of our kind of take home salaries, I think, on Finister stuff in this in this office. So uh, they sit, they're doing very well off the back of us, I'm sure. But some others that you'll all recognise there, and, and some at the bottom that relate uh, more to our area of work in construction. Kennedy Woods, who are the first architects. We've also got Stride Triglau now, actually, who've, who've joined or are a very strong, prominent uh, architectural practice in, in, in Devon uh, and the wider Southwest. They've also joined the B Corp uh, team, if you like. Triodos, a big bank that are focused on sustainable investment, as well as the kind of uh, favourites that people would be aware of globally, like Patagonia and Ben and & Jerry's and the like. So a real kind of movement. But what, what does B Corp cover? I know there's some sessions coming up later in the year uh, through Low Carbon Devon um, in, in looking at this. But I say about a bit being holistic and it truly is the assessment of how you're operated as a business, your governance, your, your absolute mission and, and your, uh, your approach to embedding triple sustainable uh, bottom line uh, within your approach to business. Workers, a bit of an Americanism. We all prefer to say people, don't we, our people? But what, what are we doing as a business across our staff and growth and workforce development and so on? Our impact in the community and our engagement with, with uh, the wider community, as well as the, the focus for today, a bit things like the environment and our, our uh, net zero impact, if you like, that we're looking to enhance upon, as well as our clients, the, the customers at the end of the day. In going through our full process uh, last year, we worked with Chris, uh, Chris Hines, who's going to speak later on, uh, and as an independent kind of um, uh, critical friend in, in the process. And we, and we went through a, an impact report um, submission where we scored 135.5, which at the time was the fourth highest score in the UK, just behind um, the big issue, which we were really surprised with. And we, we scored particularly highly on our workforce development programme, our contribution in terms of our people which we were absolutely delighted with, and it's something which we want to build on for the future. Um, but we also scored well across, across the other areas as well uh, recently. But our approach in interpreting that B Corp side of things is actually looking at that across people, places and planet. That's how we've kind of framed our approach to sustainability. And one of the things in, in guiding this particular session today was about uh, how to put those areas before profit. Well, we see it a little bit differently really in, in that you have to have the profit to be able to do the good. Without that, any business, any private sector business is just not, not able to function. Any business full stop, any local government isn't able to function without the money flowing in to be able to do the good that you're doing. But it is absolutely core to it. It's a kind of a reinforcing uh, kind of virtuous circle really in that if you're starting to do the right things and as Lindsay was saying, the clients are more and more switched on to wanting to work with others that are on that same page it is self-reinforcing that the profit starts to come and you can reinvest in the good that you want to do. And the good that we want to do, just to summarise some of those things on this slide, our workforce development plan, we're calling WWA Futures, and how we work in uh, creating links with schools from primary school age, secondary school, universities, internships, which we, we hold, those kind of things, right through to starting with, with our team at whatever age somebody's at, to growing their career, and not seeing it as a job, but a true career where they can play an active role in shaping the built environment of the future. And they can play a really positive role in shaping that. That's something which we're really passionate about and, and are focused on developing. Um, accessibility in terms of our business. We've got a um, proportionally very high uh, number of uh, women in the workforce, it, whereas in construction, it's actually historically very low. It's about 10% uh, across the country, which is shockingly low. So we're, we're well above, uh, above that and we're looking to grow that in the future at all levels, including at uh, full board level partnership within, within the business. Giving our people a voice as well is absolutely crucial on the people aspect and strengthening our kind of relationship with all staff to make sure everybody has a say and can influence the work that we do at office level or across the business. Then in terms of places, uh, our work in the built environment, deliver, developing new kind of models to work with, with the wider sector to create better places, not just doing things in a siloed way, which uh, historically construction has often done. People just do their job, they move on to the next bit and, and, and that's it. Well, actually by working more closely together across different sectors, bringing in the likes of the finance sector and so on, you can create better value. And I'll show a little bit more uh, on that at, at the end. 
as well as the volunteering work that we're doing across our offices as well. So creating stronger links in our communities, be that kind of uh, partnerships with the community sector, voluntary sector, environmental bodies and, and so on. And then more on, on this particular topic today in terms of uh, low carbon, uh, we were this year working with uh, interns on a net zero action plan. So partnering up with uh, higher, higher education students on that. And then a number of tangible projects will come out on that as well. So ensuring that we have science based targets to get us to net zero and crucially then working with the sector on um, scope three, making sure that we actually uh, get the sector performing much more sustainably in terms of its carbon impact where, you know, again, the built environment is very poor historically. So there's, there's some of those but a bit more exciting, really, a bit more graphically. So, you know, on the people side of things, making sure that you sort of sign up to and we, we have done from, for a long time now, the real living wage. It's really important. Um, the central uh, image there shows something that in the COVID period uh, where from last March, We've recently implemented a full electric vehicle fleet for our uh, pool cars. So there's about seven electric vehicles, maybe more across our offices that were just sitting there because none of us were meeting. We're all using Zoom and Teams and, and the like, and, and, and they've become um, not, not, not used. But up the road, just in our Truro office and also in our Plymouth office where we partnered with uh, local businesses that did need um, uh, vehicles. So they, this was uh, a local pub. Uh, a restaurant uh, where they're doing home deliveries for those that were socially excluded. So um, they were actually making use of our electric vehicles to deliver over 10,000 meals to, to, to those that would otherwise be popping into their pub for, for a bite to eat. So really important things like that. And we're also looking to capture the wider things in terms of our volunteering hours uh, across, across the offices. One of the questions that was put to us in, in, in coming to this is what do we see in terms of a zero carbon future? How, how do we get there? What do we seek to do? Well, there is a lot to be done, as I've just briefly mentioned, in terms of the built environment, the construction sector and getting there. And I think in the future, what we're going to start to see and what we really should see is a much closer working relationship between uh, energy solutions at the large scale, at the community scale, and built environment or construction development sector ambitions. Those two layers need to be much more closely intertwined. Um, so when new uh, developments, uh, garden villages of that scale are planned, energy solutions need to be much more closely aligned with that. And in fact, they should be, we believe, uh, barriers to making development happen or enablers of development happening. Interesting example of that would be uh, nearby, again, a project which Chris has been involved in a, a little bit, the geothermal energy. Um, why not plan development and uses around that geo, geothermal energy assets with, with food production, with cleaning, with those that need that energy 24 seven, we should be starting to think about that across all of our developments. Um, the bottom image on the right hand side is um, a solar canopy and EV charge point infrastructure design, which we've developed in Ward Williams Associates. We'll be looking to roll out across a lot of our projects, but utilising pretty dull assets like car parks as uh, potential energy centres is the kind of thinking that which isn't just optional. It should be absolutely essential. And that's the kind of direction that we need to be getting towards. And those on the slide there that I'm showing in terms of clients, consultants, contractors, supply chain, we all need to be working together much more closely and making sure that, as Lindsay referred to, it won't be optional in the future that government policy will be driving this. But why not? As a sector, we should be pushing this anyway. It should be a carrot as much as a stick and us working much more sensibly with financial institutions because they have some of the cash to answer the questions to get the longer term return that we can then implement better projects. We shouldn't be looking at things in such a narrow minded way. And, 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 and to my mind, we need to be absolutely adamant on that. We shouldn't walk along to a, to a client to have a session to work with them and say, yes, we hear what you're saying and we'll do exactly what you say. We should be challenging, pushing, promoting the best possible quality across everything that we do across the uh, quality of design to create better communities, better connections, you know, that people are proud to live in those places, uh, enhancing uh, town centres and city centres, which are perhaps a little bit more redundant at the moment with the decline in retail, actually reinventing those, but embedding energy solutions into those approaches as well. Uh, and, and not seeing money as the be all and end all. If there's no planet here at the end of all of this, what is the point in having a nice shiny new building for, for the sake of it? So. 
that's how we want to push the sector. And I've, we're, we're encouragingly, very encouraging. What we're seeing is a lot more people very keen to engage in that whole conversation. People are on that page. Clients are on that page. Local authorities, you know, there are big commissioners and the NHS and, and, and those higher education institutions, they're all on that page. So if we're all doing it, let's absolutely get behind it and make it happen. So that's a, more of a call to action from our perspective, really. We want to see that happen. And uh, yeah, let's let, let, let's make that happen. That was it for me, Chris, really. I'm happy to cover questions at the end. Yeah, great. Awesome. Thanks, Scott, again. Um, really lovely to hear that sort of collaborative approach and inclusive approach and sort of big, big, big picture thinking as well as practical examples. Um, so yeah, really keen. If you've got any questions for Scott, do put them in the chat. Uh, same with Lindsay. And we'll, I think we'll flow straight on um, to, to introduce Debbie from, from Finisterre. So yeah, Debbie, over to you. Hi everyone. Um, let me know. Can you see and hear me? Okay. Yeah. Can, can yeah. All good. You. Okay. Marvelous. So, thank you. Grand. Hi. Um. So yeah. I said I'm Debbie. Um. And I am the product rep at Finister. Um. I look after the product at the brand. Um. That's really through the concept the design stage and the sourcing stage all the way through to the customer and its point of sale. I've been at the brand for a good while now, for 13 years. Um, before that, I worked as a designer um, in what's now more commonly called fast fashion, so the other side of the coin. Um, I, back 13 years ago, there were about three or four of us. Um, so this pitch is a little bit out of date. We were all allowed to be back together again. So this is this is us. We're about 56 of us now. So we've, we've very much grown as a brand um, during the time that I've been there. But um, actually, sorry. very, very much. Sorry, Debbie, I don't. Did, if you're meaning to share screen, uh, that's not happening. If you are. Oh, yes, I am. It's not happening. You didn't miss anything. Don't worry, everybody. <laughs> oh, that's cool. I just want to double check. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, here we How's go. How's that? Yeah. You think you think I'd get the hang of this by now? That's awesome. A... <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Yes, there's a little snapshot. So that was us, um, as I say, probably two years ago. Um, but we have we haven't all been able to be together, um, which which has been tough because um, it's it's a pretty tight knit uh, community of people. Um, but we have very much grown um, in the last sort of couple of years. We've particularly grown as a brand in in many ways, but very much um, our sort of commitments and our ethos and values really haven't changed since Tom started the brand back in 2003. Um, just I suppose a moment on, on me, um, what gets me out of bed um, every day. Um, I'm, I count myself very lucky to live and work in the fashion industry in Cornwall, because you know, it's, it's, it's quite a small pool. Um, I do love my job. What gets me out of bed every day is really this, the problem solving aspects, um, not only of, sort of designing um, products, but in creating supply chains, which are sustainable um, and developing innovative textile solutions to minimize our impact. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a job that will never be done. Um, so a bit of context about the brand. So as I said, the brand started in 2003 um, by Tom Kay. Um, he's, if anyone that knows him, he's a real out and out waterman. Um, he created the brand really from a, a desire uh, to of what was missing actually in the market, um, but to make fit for purpose lasting products that enable a relationship with the natural world. And um, for the very beginning of the brand, um, there was a, a very strong desire to create a purpose-led and meaningful place of work for anyone that comes to Finisterre, um, as well as everyone that's involved in making the product and the community that we connect via our clothing and our storytelling. And back in 2018, um, we went through a very rigorous and ongoing um, certification process, which, which Scott has done an excellent job of explaining to become a B Corp. Um, so B Corp, as Scott has already explained, is very much this global movement 
um, of, of people that want to use business as a force for good. And what we've found really, really um, rewarding about the B Corp process is that it, it gives us not only a community of people to interact with and to share challenges and, and solutions with, but also it, it's quite a helpful vision of what good could look like. So the B Corp process really sort of provides a set of goals and a framework to work towards, a, a guide of what good looks like, which is, which is super handy. Um, it's for some businesses, it might be that you're, you're all about the environment or you're all about the sort of social welfare. So, so elements of the, B Corp, um, the BIA framework are sort of more useful to some businesses than others. But it is available for everybody. I, I didn't know this until we embarked on, on B Corp. So you don't have to be a B Corp to use a BIA framework. So you can use it really as this kind of pathway of, um, of, what, of what good looks like. And imagine that you're a sort of, you know, a social enterprise or you're a you know, fair trade chocolate brand. You, you know, you will go maybe down slightly different um, avenues, but it really opens up um, this community and this idea of what good business is about. Um, from a Finisterre point of view, these, these goals, um, they, sort of, they, they sound quite good um, when you're doing the B Corp process and it, you know, it, it sort of works from a sort of strategy and a policy uh, point of view. But actually interacting with a product team day to day um, and interacting with our customer, how do we like, create, from a layman's point of view, this something into something that's meaningful and practical? For us, we've always done it through our um, three points of commitment. They've been there since the very beginning. Um, and this is this really gives us this, this, this framework, um, this lens at Finisterre as a positive impact business. Our commitment to product is about creating circular products. And this includes using fully recycled and recyclable and renewable materials, as well as driving circular business models and behavior. Um, a good example of this is our lived and loved uh, repair uh, service, which has been in place um, since the beginning, and our resale platform, which we've just launched. And this is all about extending product lifespan and reducing waste. So a huge amount of our focus is in, in making products well, making it last well, so you don't have to keep buying. Um, from an environmental point of view and, and a people point of view, our commitment is centered on improving the health of our oceans. So this is through the materials that we use. So actually in creating textiles, we have a huge responsibility, whether it be through the dyes that we used, whether it be the, the microfiber loss from our textiles or the, the carbon that is produced in our supply chain. So it's, you know, it's, it's a cross that we need to bear. Um, equally, it's engaging and inspiring our community to advocacy, to protect our seas. And Lindsay did a fantastic job um, of, of coming on board with Protect Blue uh, to, to initiate C7. And this was all about just getting this awareness and this inspiration, this engagement, this, this conversation out there, um, because you know, it's for everybody uh, to, to collaborate and to interact, to take this to the next level. So we really operate a, a collaborative and tireless approach to improvement as a purpose-driven and positive impact business. There isn't, unfortunately, particularly in the fashion industry, that there really isn't a quick fix. It's not a case of we just need to all switch out and use a certain fiber. Um, it, it is, there is no get out of jail for the clothing and textile industry in terms of combating the climate crisis. It's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a tough, a fairly up, would um, struggle but actually you've just got to remain positive and you've got to um, keep on pushing actually I'm constantly um, inspired and my faith renewed by the amount of innovation that has come out of um, the, the textile and clothing industry particularly from the supply chain over the last decade so yes some of these things are tough but they can be done um, I'm going to share one of our biggest challenges at Finisterre um, since I've been at the brand, which is the, um, the carbon question. Um, it's absolutely the biggest challenge in front of us. There's no getting away from the fact that we're in the business of making stuff. Yeah, we make things and this takes energy. And unfortunately, I think the, um, the moment, the, um, there's a far too much greenwashing um, and marketing, which is confusing this. So the amount of 
you know, net zero, um, carbon neutral and carbon positive clothing brands that are making these claims are really confusing uh, this topic, which is a really tough topic, topic and we need to address it, um, you know, humbly and honestly. Um, so the biggest thing I think that I, you know, from my point of view, this sort of anti anti greenwash as well is is understanding the complexity when you talk about if you are in the business of making clothing, working with eight different countries across 27 different factories, um, this, this, is, this isn't something you're going to com complete and um, work out in, in, in a couple of months by getting a consultancy on board. This is tough, yeah? So I really want to just, for anyone that thinks brands are lazy by not going carbon neutral, um, you know, we need to understand what's involved here. So a year ago, we embarked on mapping out our entire carbon footprint um, with the help of a fellow B Corp called Green Element. If anybody needs any help, um, I highly recommend them um, really to get visibility of what our carbon emissions were across all of our business operations. And that's the key point. It's the all of our business operations. So you get a lot of people that will say that they're carbon neutral or that they they've got to net zero in, in six months. And actually, unfortunately, when you lift the lid, a lot of the time you'll find that it's their scope one or their scope one to two, if, if you're lucky, emissions, which is really that's the bit that's in your control. That's your head office. It's your light bulbs. It's your business travel, if you're lucky. It's it's fairly easy in the big scheme of things you know, to, to get um, net zero if you're only controlling um, you know, effectively it's your bills. Flip to the other side to scope three, um, and this this graphic here just gives you a little sense of what's involved. Um, and you've got to go if you do this properly, which we did, um, and it, that's why it took us two years to do. Um, but you've got to go to every level. You know, you're looking at how your your tier three suppliers, which might be the people that dye your fabrics, they spin your fabrics. It could be down to the the um, the transportation that takes the fleece off the back of the sheep to the to the spinners to the dye house all of this stuff um, has an, an impact so we went to that degree so here's a bit of an infographic um, just to give you an idea there and the um, the, the, the fairly um, shocking number is that 80 percent of all of our emissions are within our supply chain which is scope three so that's the materials the transportation and the manufacture I mean, it sounds shocking, but actually, when you really think about it, of course it does. Yes, yeah, so this is this is this is manufacturing. This is making stuff. So I'm not saying this to um, make you go off in a stare. Um, Scott, please keep buying it. Um, but this is unfortunately this is the nature of the beast. This is absolutely true for whether you're buying a sofa, you're buying a T-shirt from the most sustainable brand, you know, all the way through to fast fashion. This is just the reality and the facts ahead of us. The good news. Um, is that factories and supply chain are really cottoning onto this fast and they're, they're really investing in, um, in renewable alternatives and, and renewable uh, transportation as well. This is all happening. This is not sort of pie in the sky stuff. But actually for me, I suppose my soapbox moment is you know, to, to lift the lid when you see these carbon neutral and, and net zero um, sort of claims. And so what does that actually mean? Because a lot of it is just offsetting. Um, and that's not really addressing the huge problem that's ahead of us. So, yeah, honesty, reality check is my is my soapbox moment um, in terms of not to terrify you all. I mean, I think there is a lot to do um, there. We do need to have some of these honest conversations and to share some of these challenges and solutions. I constantly remain inspired and positive by the younger generation, particularly that the Gen Z that are coming up who really question. Um, they, they, they sort of keep us on our toes. They constantly um, will ask the bigger questions and not sort of as likely to be greenwashed. This is good news. Um, they're motivated to action and interested in climate and social justice. Um, it's an exciting and critical time um, to be in any industry, particularly industries of making things and to take on these challenges together. It's the only way we're going to actually achieve any solutions. Um, it's collaboration and it's it's across industry. It's from innovators, it's designers, it's creatives, it's government, it's science, and it's from consumers. We, we, we absolutely need consumers to, to be understanding and impatient at the same time. 
Um, we're all in it together. Um, I strongly believe there's no place for cynicism uh, or apathy. Um, and it's all about time for action and optimism. Thank you very much. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Debbie. Um, really great to, to, to just hear that overview and get that insight. And yeah, I totally agree with that you know transparency and it is difficult um but you know if it if it was um you know one of my favorite sort of mottos is you know if it's if it's easy it's not worth doing um and really i think you've given us a really good example of sort of rising to that challenge but in a sort of open and honest way um so yeah thank you um like like with scott and Lindsay, if you've got any questions for for debbie do put them in the chat and we can pick those up uh shortly but we'll flow straight on again to our, our final speaker, um, Chris Hines, over to you. Um, okay, we got that. Who am I? Yeah, we've got so that. that. Right. Uh, so I've got about 35 slides. I'm going to go like clappers and most of it's already been said. Uh, lovely to be here. Who am I? Um, whoop, how do I do that down here? Oh, come on. I can't move my slides for some reason or other. You've fallen at the first hurdle. Oh, got it. Okay. Uh, so I've been doing this campaigning stuff for about 31 years now. I was co-founder of Surfs Against Sewage, which I ran for uh, from 1990 to 2000. And I had a conversation yesterday or last couple of days with someone. They were doing some uh talk about how we persuade people to uh deal with climate change and get involved and they came back to me and just said well and i said well it's kind of campaigning and they said well campaigning no it's far more than just raising awareness campaigning uh, and i went back and this was a senior lecturer at a university in communications a highly intelligent woman who had run a business and sold it for four million pounds and she came back and that's what she's teaching her bloody students and i went back and she hasn't come back and i said when we did this we went politically we bought shares in every single water company um we you we had our blood sucked our mouth swabbed we proved the science etc etc um, and campaigning is a multi, and if you look at the definition of um, campaigning, it is a complex, structured, organisationed movement. And that's what we're all part of. Um, what's vot motivating me? Dartmoor, waves, equal rights. And I can't believe this album's like way, way back. But how are we still not in a world where women are treated and paid equally, people irrespective of their age, gender, race, background, we're not all treated equally. And it just is incredibly frustrating that we're not there. But we have to have that universal solidarity with each other. How is it that this is still the situation? You know, if I turn around to, you know, the two women here, Debbie and Lindsay, and said, uh, by the way, you're 17%, 0.5% worth less than me, you know, I'd be then having to run for the hills. And my mother was never 17.5% less, uh, worth less than my dad. Um, and these motivate me, my great niece and great uncle, I don't have children, but it's them. You know, if I ever feel a little bit jaded, I've got to get up and do it for them. And this great quote from Alice Walker, who wrote Colour Purple, etc. Activism is the rent I pay for living on the planet. What am I working on? Um, staying happy. And uh, I think being content with our world and that, you know, uh, mindfulness uh, is a really important thing. And I've got a great book, 50 Key Thinkers on the Environment. Number one is Buddha. Um, triple bottom line thinking. Again, this should be moving rapidly forward on this. Um, linear economy, moving to circular economy. Um, and, you know, the whole climate change thing. If we think COVID has been tough, then, you know, what's coming our way is incredibly uh, challenging. And things like, you know, uh, so I think climate change, but also biodiversity, because biodiversity is running alongside and the two are interlinked. But, you know, this is a UN report. The world is on notice showing one million species will go extinct if we don't sort our, our, ourselves out. And yet we're still arrogant enough to think that we're not one of those species. If one million go down, bet your bottom dollar, we are one of them. Um, 
I work with companies like Ward Williams and electric vehicles, but I also get to do amazing talks. I, I did a talk about um, six weeks ago to the whole of um, Rockstar Games globally. So I, in the afternoon, I was talking to London and India, and then in the evening to uh, California, New York and uh, Toronto. And my challenge to them, I guess, was how do they use things like their gaming to be that kind of a communicator of change? How can they pull people in? And also, what's the carbon footprint of their operations? How, you know, there's massive use there. Lots of people I know, and again, intelligent people who think they're being alternative are saying, oh yeah, I'm making a lot of money off Bitcoin recently. It's got the carbon footprint of the whole of Argentina, half the carbon footprint of the UK. We need to be truthful, as Debbie was saying. We can't just hide behind that and then go and consume other stuff that really is just shafting the planet. Um, I went just before the first lockdown, I went and spoke at a youth summit down in um, Geneva, uh, the UN, and I was talking to them about how much power each of us has in our pocket. And there were about 100 students in the room. And each one of them, I said, if you go to university, you're going to spend for the first time in your life, you can have £9,000 each year in your pocket. You should be asking those universities, what, you know, where's their energy come from? Where do they source their food, et cetera, et cetera. So that power in your pocket, you know, we were hoping there was going to be 70 people on here, but people have gone to the beach, et cetera. But, you know, this is just how much money we have. Say you earn £30,000 over 40 years. Uh, with inflation increases, it would be probably £1.75 million each that you have a choice on how you will spend it. And, you know, we should all subscribe to things like ethical consumers so we know what we're buying. You know, I, I opened it the other day and I looked at some beer and I'm going to go and have a good go at a mate of mine because he buys old speckled hen. And it's the worst beer you can buy. Um, B Corp, done lots of that. This is a great quote. There, this was the original quote, no margin, no mission, was by a nurse who uh, was saying that, you know, you needed to run things well because the, the better you ran stuff in the health provision services, then the more you could deliver the mission of keeping well. Um, Paul Critchley, who, again, they're kind of in the process of um, gaining B Corp accreditation and Smile Together, our staff owned community interest company addressing oral health poverty in uh, Cornwall. And Paul the other day said, well, more margin, more mission. So the more money you can make, the more you can plow back in. And a classic example of that, because they're staff owned, because they, they make their own decisions. I was talking to them and I said, well, why don't we kind of give some prop? Why don't we do give away some toothbrushes and things to food banks? So, yep, they voted on that as an organisation and spent £15,000 providing oral health packs with toothbrushes and toothpaste and, you know, brushing guides and everything to food banks throughout Cornwall. Facts and experts, you know, when did we end up being, you know, bamboozled? I don't watch the mainstream media. Well, the mainstream media, you know who appoints them. They're held responsible. If they say something, they can be sued. All of these idiots on faceache, etc. You know, we listen to a world where people are saying, "Oh, yeah, but I read something by the um, Zurich uh, Science Organization." There's no one there. That's like me saying, "You know, Debbie, why don't we and Scott we could form the um, St Agnes Science Group, but probably give it a good name like Co like Oxford or Cambridge Analytica." This is rubbish, and we need to love science. Um, you know, and again, these people being manipulated the wrong way so that, you know, they're part of that kind of believing that, you know, if you if, if you're not into having a vaccination, then you can't argue because you don't you doubt the science. It's the same scientists who will treat you if you're ill. And it's the same scientists who are the people saying climate change is coming our way. Um, I sit on a sustainability advisory panel to the BBC. So, you know, this is just a scope of what is happening. Watch out for this logo. It was originally only on programmes like, you know, the Spring Watch here, but it's everywhere now. It's on programmes like, you know, all the football recently, but Strictly Come Dancing, et cetera, et cetera. And importantly, one of the early uptakes of um, Albert's sustainable production, which is where they look at the carbon footprint of what they're doing. And it's not easy for them, as Debbie's saying, this stuff's really tough was Coronation Street. And what happened there was that Coronation Street 
the production company went for Albert's sustainable production. And then the script writers went, well, what on earth is this about? And then they developed a character who was talking about uh, sustainability. And that, that is what we do. We need to communicate. Everyone in the world should be doing their carbon footprint. Um, we need to have be positive about the future. This is the big issue, um, uh, Lord Bird, And he's pushing through the Houses of Parliament now, a thing called the Future Generations Bill, which will require that all public bodies take into consideration the impacts of their decision on future generations. And again, we need to vote. We have the power to do this. Um, a couple of books I'm reading, Mark Carney, Values, cheap as this is a brain stretch because I never did economics, but he's fundamentally saying, uh, and, and I'll quote, when he did the Reith lectures, the BBC Reith lectures, if you don't want to read the book, listen to the BBC Reith lectures, that there is a poverty of perspective amongst the people setting the values in our society. And that is true. And we need to look out for each other and the planet. Brilliant book by Jonathan Porritt, one of my heroes and probably Britain's best ever environmental campaigner, I would say, The World We Made. And this is a book set in the year 2050. And it's written by the character Alex in the character of Alex McKay. And Alex was born in the year 2000. It's 2050. Um, but he's saying we've largely made it. There were the world food riots of 2023 when tens of thousands of people died on the streets of our capital cities. New Orleans finally has been abandoned to sea level rise, but we've largely built all of our systems, our healthcare, our food, et cetera, et cetera. And being Jonathan and with Forum for the Future behind him, everything is referenced. Everything is a possibility. And we need to use every tool that is used to sell this pooey pants version of the world to us for purely capitalist, selfish gain. And we need to use those tools and use them better. We need to stretch every sinew and buzz every neuro to make sure that we do this. And, you know, we need to plant some trees. Here's all my oaks. I planted a, a hundred um, acorns and I think I got about a 95% success rate. That's me done. Great stuff. Thanks, Chris. Um, really insightful. And yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, it would be awesome to bring on the other speakers so we can have a discussion um, if we can make that happen. Just want to say thank you as well to my colleague Hayley, who's working in the background, um, Hayley Holt. So a huge thank you to making this happen. So we've got Scott, Debbie and Lindsay. If Lindsay is there as well. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, I went really quick there because I thought we were probably quite a bit tired. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, injection of energy. Um, awesome. I'm just going to start off with a quick question and then we'll, we'll delve into some questions that have come in the chat and any questions you have as well as speakers. But Chris, you mentioned a few books there. I've actually got um, The World We Made, brilliant book. Um, I just wondered, the other speakers... Have you got any inspiring books you're reading at the moment? Or if there was one book you'd recommend for anyone in the audience to read, what would it be and why? Um, Scott, what about you? The wrong one for me. I'm all about travel books, to be honest with you. And it's all about escapism for me. And it's to generally people traveling the world on a bike. So I suppose that is sustainability in its purest form and adventure and kind of experience. But uh, in terms of anything for you to read, uh, which might be on that wavelength i'm sorry i can't offer it <laughs> awesome. I, could pretend. I could i could blag it but i'm not gonna <laughs> yeah well i'll jump in there um i'm a big fan of cycling as well there's i think alistair humphrey's book about cycling around the world really really amazing two books um can't think of the names now but do look that up um debbie what about you are you there debbie Uh, we'll go to Lindsay and then come back. Lindsay, what about you? I'm like looking at my bookshelf now, trying to figure <laughs> out. Um, this one, which I'm going to put a disclaimer because it's not an easy book to read, but it is the one that is blowing my mind the most. Uh, Climate, a new story from um, Charles Eisenstein. Uh, if you could see my copy, it's like dog-eared and there's pencil scribblings all over it. And I feel like I can only read about four pages at a time before my brain feels like it might explode but it's definitely it's the thing that is uh challenging the way we talk about climate and the narrative it's super super interesting 
Oh, awesome. I'll have to check that one out. Cool. Um, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Debbie, yeah, did you, do you have a book you'd recommend? Yeah, sorry, I think my internet's a bit lame. Um, yeah, I've, I've got two recommendations. One is one not to read, um, which is, I think, 10 billion, I think it's called. Really depressing, took me about three months to get over. It's basically that we're all toast and there's no point in trying anything, so don't read that. And then one that is worth reading when I decided not to read any more depressing books is The Future We Choose, um, which is by Christina Figueres um, of, of UN um, Climate um, Fame. Um, really inspirational, practical tips on how you can actually make a difference wherever you are um, within your own life and within your career as well. Really good read. Hmm. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Debbie. Um, maybe we'll stay with you, Debbie, because there's a, there's a few questions in the chat um, around Finisterre and your approach. Um, there's a question related to the values of your organisation and, and was that difficult in terms of um convincing maybe decision makers in the business or was that i think you highlight it but maybe you could bring that to life a bit more did you have to convince anyone that b corp was a good idea or was it just like yes we're doing this i mean we 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 were fair as i said at the beginning i think it was very much sort of built into our dna um so i think that's made it an awful lot easier in that respect so those conversations are easier to have I'm, I'm, I'm on the board. I'm, you know, so I, I, I do get to, to sort of have those, those, those say, but I'm, you know, I wouldn't have accepted no anyway, quite bloody minded. So some of it back to Chris's point, you have to just keep, keep saying it until people have had enough of you as well. So, you know, if you want something to, um, to happen, no matter where you are, you know, just, just, just keep pushing it really. But also I think really our customer demands it, you know, so to be honest, a good business decision um, it's the same thing as a good decision for the planet is a good, you know, it, it's all sort of one of the same um, because it's real and authentic and not not just a marketing campaign, which could be cynical and say in other places is. <laughs> so that, that's our answer. Yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. I, d I don't know what if anyone else wanted to come in there. Um, Scott, what about you? Was that similar within Ward Williams Associates or? Yeah, I think, uh, again, you know, we've, we've had a legacy for some time of trying to do things in the right way, but we've done we've done it in our own informal way. Um, and, and I think there was a bit of an internal sales pitch needed in terms of well, why do we need to do something which is going to have that stamp to it? And I think showing the added value and the collaboration and learning from others that we can do through the B Corp process really sold it to people internally. And we're starting to see the real benefits of that in, in terms of our, our staff engagement in improving uh, new clients actually being uh, hooked on the back of seeing us as a B Corp and trying to do the right thing. So that's been a really positive experience over the last year. It's actually a year yesterday that we uh, credited. So it's been a positive first year, that's for sure. Mm. Cool. Uh, really great to hear. I mean, yeah, you mentioned there, I think, I'm not sure if one of you touched upon it, but I think their B Corp scheme is sort of every three years. So it's based on sort of continual um, improvement. And the sort of standards get tougher each time. I know it's Debbie that you're coming up for your recertification. Do you have any exciting plans that you could share with us? We're in the middle of it um, now, actually. I mean, I would say, my word, it's got so much tougher than three years ago. I can't believe how how much has changed. Actually, and that's clearly a good thing. Um, you know, it needs to be tough. One thing I found really interesting through the process is we've, in some respects, we've actually been sort of Talk, te teaching them um so there's some stuff that's very niche in terms of say wool farming and you know we didn't get a tick for something we didn't get points and we argued it back and went hang on a minute this is like the latest cutting edge regenerative standards and they didn't know so what I, I think is brilliant about that is it's it's not just your tick box you know it really is this interactive um it's very complex uh, the way that b corp works but behind it all there are they are still humans there's an awful lot of that kind of humanity um it's really tough though my word i mean i mean i think i think if anyone that is um don't be daunted by it you know do 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 um do do it so a brilliant thing to do i think as scott said it's a particularly from an employment point of view as well it's 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 becoming a real you know badge of what a good business and a good employer is but it is um it is really really tough and thorough and getting increasingly so mm. 
as it should be, I think. And yeah, really, really nice to hear you say that. Um, there's a question that just popped in, um, just out of my <laughs> peripheral vision about carbon offsetting. Um, Chris, I didn't know if you wanted to pick up on that. How do you feel yeah, about carbon offsetting? So there's you got two quick stories there. One, I can remember someone turning up and um, pitching it to Tim Smith at Eden. Um, and he, they were the same company who uh, offset the whole of um, the Brit Awards. And this, so this would be 15, 16 years ago. And um, I happened to be leaving early that day and I kind of walked up and I saw this guy pulling out the car park in a Jag and he was wheel spinning. Um, and surprise, surprise, that same company was shown that the Brit Awards, the trees that they had were actually, they treble sold them. So there's a lot of kind of, again, greenwash in there. The key is, and, and, and I think this is like picking up on what Debbie's saying, you can't just solve it by carrying on business as normal and then you just offset. You know, this has to be deep within as, as much reduction as you can. Do we then offset what's remaining? It's probably a good idea, but only if you have a really strong bought in thoroughly reviewed every few months and absolutely bought in and you understand the dynamics that the target is is to get that down to absolutely as, as small a carbon footprint as possible and some of it will be about that you know you can't go and buy say you've got a manufacturing machine and that needs 10 years to run to pay itself back now maybe you can persuade the board of that company to let you buy a more, far more energy efficient machine five years down the line. But you need to keep driving those targets. So it's the kind of, you know, it's the last resort to go and do. And absolutely don't think of it that you can carry on with business as usual and just offset. So, but I think Debbie and Scott and whatever, he can come in on that one. But it, yeah, I think yeah. we probably wasted 10 years by people doing that. Yeah, let's go to Lindsay and then Debbie, because I know, Lindsay, you, you um, could maybe share some sort of ocean offsetting or ocean rewilding. Yeah, yeah now that I like, yeah. Yeah, if it's going to work, <laughs> if it's going to work, yeah. and, and it's, it's 10 times more efficient, eh? Yes, so yeah, uh, plant sea trees instead of regular trees, because there's lots yeah. of stuff happening in that space. Um, it's kind of an interesting one because, there, you know, that blue carbon space you're playing oh. catch up in terms of verification. So it's tricky because if you are, you know, a B Corp and you need to make sure that if you are offsetting that things are verified, you might find that more difficult. But um, yeah, the blue carbon space is really interesting. But I think what, what we've seen and what we get excited about is when, you know, we're shifting away from that word sustainable towards the word regenerative. And it's like put back in more than you took, you know? So um, we work with a, an organization in the States called Sustainable Surf, um, and they have a whole kind of campaign around ocean positive. Um, and the idea is, yeah, you, you, you should be 10 times ocean positive. So one of the brands that we do loads of work with is Starboard, um, based in Thailand, makes stand up paddle boards, wind surfs, kite surfs, and all that sort of stuff. And every board that they, they create, they, they footprint, but then they make sure um, they are doing huge amounts, again, another B Corp, um, huge amounts to reduce their footprint. And then what's left over, they will do um, 10 times rather than just get to that level. So for me, that feels like that's the right, right way to do it. I've just seen in the chat, yeah, there's really amazing seagrass st happening, stuff happening in the UK as well um, that's worth checking out. Yeah, the ocean, I think it's the Ocean Conservation Trust um, in Plymouth. Um, and there's some great examples of that. Yeah. Debbie, did you want to add anything to that? Just to echo um, what both speakers have said there already. I mean, uh, the, the idea of offsetting, I think, unfortunately, is very much that get out of jail. And it is kind of you can just carry on doing what you're doing and then just you know, sort of salve your soul on the other side. So I think it's a dangerous red herring um, in terms of, however, um, knowing that we've got we've got to do something right. I think when it comes to carbon reduction, it's, it's absolutely we all need to be reducing. Unfortunately, it, we're not at a stage yet. There's not enough renewable energy. There isn't enough wind and solar for everybody to go straight away there at the moment. So offsetting in tandem in partnership with reduction is a, is a necessity but we don't like to use the word offsetting because i think actually it's it's 
than it is like I'm going to go and plant a tree. So I'm just going to pay somebody to tell me they're going to plant some trees that maybe one day in a few generations time might make a difference. <sighs> Come on. Um, whereas actually actively participating in something that is about regenerative biodiversity you know so it's not just about carbon I think it's just these really weird narrow kind of fields we put in things and go well let's just worry about carbon then you know so yeah just to to wrap it all up we're we are um investing in a in a seagrass um project which is new news Lindsay so very very exciting and almost certainly because of, of your input um, which is which isn't about we're not going to say buy this and you get this carbon back we're going to say by this and we're supporting biodiversity in this incredible project to protect our oceans it's a different i think it's a different language and an important one customers need to be explored. we all we're all consumers we're all humans and citizens we all need to get this stuff yeah and i think the language there is really important isn't it like you said maybe it should be like i don't know resetting but it's like when um i have conversations around nature connection and it's like taking time out to connect with nature as, as Lindsay might have highlighted but actually maybe it's taking time in to connect um so I just wanted to pick on that pick up on that maybe Lindsay but uh, you mentioned nature being a co-facilitator um how does that sort of come across in your work do you do you get some sort of skepticism about that or is it sort of largely the people you're working with are on board or um, the majority are on board because it's, it kind of ends up like the folk that we're just working with have similar values. But I think, I think they're on board in principle and then they're like, oh, you actually want us to go and do this outside. <laughs> so there's definitely a shift. But I think, you know, C7 is a really good example, right? So we're, we're designing this thing. We all know because of COVID and everything, it's not an in-person event. It needs to be online. It was like six and a half hours of streaming. And so part of the design of that event was like, we need to make sure that whole thing is available as audio so that people don't have to sit in front of their screens. And so, you know, we built that into the event. And I think generally um, it only takes, it, for us normally with our strategy stuff, it only takes one session for people to be completely sold on it. Um, and they're just like, oh my God, I've got to hang out. You know, I, they're doing it remotely and distributed a di bit different, but everyone's like, I either got to hang out with people I really care about outdoors and just have really deep, meaningful conversations with zero distractions other than like you know that classic squirrel where actually it is a squirrel when we do it which is amazing um but I think yeah it normally takes one session and people really understand how much more creative they are and from our perspective in terms of facilitation people are just way more present it's it's way easier to do our job when we're all outside because they're not looking at emails or people aren't coming in the office and phones aren't ringing um and it just what it does is it takes our process and it makes that into an experience in itself. So it's not just the end result of like, oh, we've done your strategy. It's like, we all had a really nice time and we spent some time outdoors. So yeah, it, 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 for us, it feels like we couldn't really do it any other way, I think. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, thanks you. Yeah, I totally get what you mean. Um, I'm just gonna go to Scott actually, cause I've just seen a question I've missed around your, um, I don't know if you've seen that one in the chat, but it's, it's around, yeah, you're working and if you work with people um, or you might turn down projects that don't. Yeah. Do you want to expand on that one? Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting question when that came through and it actually, it does resonate and, and, it, and it has been the case. So um, there's a, it was a kind of a double question there really about certain targets that we've got for projects when we work on them in terms of green space and, and credentials that it has to hit. It's, there's no kind of uh, generic credentials that we'd have to hit for any project, but things like biodiversity net gain, we'd always work on and, and promote with clients and really push the boundaries on that. We try and take them well beyond the kind of statutory obligations that they've got. And what we find is that we tend to work with the same clients re repeatedly, larger scale clients, and 85% of our business is repeat business. So you tend to work with them, grow their the offer with them and develop that kind of same design principles. And as we learn new things from collaborating with others, we try to grow and improve that. But the, the second part of the question was around, um, do we turn down projects and, and, and clients? And yes, we do, and we have done, and in fact, quite recently. Um, and I, as you'd expect, it would be the kind of um, what you'd probably term old school now approach to housing development, whereby it just didn't fit with what we wanted to offer. Um, they, they had a specific kind of business model they wanted to hit, but didn't fit with the direction of doing things correctly, rightly, you know, and they didn't really want to move in that direction. 
And so what we try and do is take people on that journey with us. If they're not doing things the right way, that we don't feel, we try and grow and learn with them. Um, they weren't willing to go down that route, so we didn't work with them. So, yeah, I think you have to stand by your principles. And that's the thing I'm quite proud of this business actually about. And, and I know the others are like that as well, is that actually to be quite vocal about it, not, not to, to the detriment of other people, but to actually promote the things that you want to do well and really push the boundaries on that. And, and we'll continue to do that, even if it doesn't work for us uh, commercially. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it's a tricky balance, isn't it? About bringing, yeah, bringing people with you, uh, but also, yeah, standing to what you believe in. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks for picking up on that. Um, I'll be really curious to hear from people around um, maybe just like one piece of, if you were to give everyone an attribute or a skill to be able to do what they do better, what, what would it be and why? Um, Chris, maybe start with you. Oh, you're on mute. Car second time today. True. Truth, second time today, thank you. <laughs> uh, to tell the truth, I weirdly, I was I, someone, there's a project I know that is, has, has uh, kind of drifted from its mission. And it's because someone came in and that person tells porky pies. And that he is such a detrimental effect on the project. And even this week, this uh, this or last week, the same person said something to me, and then I spoke to someone else, and it's a complete lie what he said, absolute complete lie. And if only if we're talking the truth and taking responsibility for ourselves, that would be a thing. So the skill, I guess, would be able to have like a a color that would come down across the like would go. You could look at someone who went Burp, like a red dot in the center of their forehead, would they were going lie, and then you could just go. And just think about how our politicians that would work. Oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> but something like that, something hugely practical and useful. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, Debbie, what about you? Uh, I think mine would be curiosity, um, but the, the kind of childish curiosity. Mm. I think there's so much that is gained when you just ask questions and keep asking them like children do, the whole why, why, why. Whenever I go to factories and mills and you keep saying you know if someone tells you something you think you've heard it before and you go but why is it done like that and why is it done like that and can we do it something differently you get to some incredible places and they love it people love it when you ask them questions because you're engaged and you're interested and you're passionate uh, so yeah I think everyone should ask a million questions a day in the same way that toddlers do <laughs> you are childlike yeah cool uh Scott um I think uh, twin track both uh, passion and stubbornness combined and I think those two are a lethal combination and I think you know those people on this this call today everybody is uh, clearly showing that you know from listening in from talking or whatever and we can make things happen and I think we, we all see that in whatever we're working on we can see things happen and I think if we can encourage others to be like that things can happen much quicker so yeah definitely and actually of the two passion and stubbornness I'd probably go for stubbornness, the refusal to accept no as as the uh, as the driver. A bit of anger, a bit of fire in the belly, yeah. always helps. Yeah, maybe it's the, to transform that anger into to hope for me, maybe. Um, but yeah, Lindsay, what about you? I feel like everyone's stolen my words. <laughs> I was like, damn. Anyway, so yeah, definitely the curiosity piece and the stubbornness. I guess. Um, the bit I would add in is is like a level of optimism, like realistic optimism, but but visioning what the future could look like. I think we uh, all too often get really caught up in, uh, and it's you know it's quite hard to avoid it of like these horror like horror film type images of what might happen. But um, I've always been really inspired by Alexandra Cousteau, and um, and I remember I was at a workshop she was running last year, and and she talked a lot about like yeah, what if we started to vision what the world could like could look like what the ocean could look like and and move towards that rather than trying to move away from something pretty horrific so yeah some level of optimism and visioning i think yeah awesome good to hear um we're just coming up over over time but it's great to see um children on the in, in the shot uh, just reminded me of your wwa uh, war williams associates um futures i think you call it scott yeah. really really 
seems like a great initiative, but it also reminded me of something um, just to share with the audience, um, Good Energy, the energy company, have a Good Futures board. And it's about involving school children in their board of, or creating a board of directors made up of school children. And I just thought I'd share that because it reminded me. And wouldn't it be amazing if all of our companies had that approach, um, something to explore, I think, or, or be curious about. Um, but it would be great to hear um, just a little bit more from, from, from everyone before we wrap up. Maybe just one... Yeah, one piece, uh, building on that skill set, maybe one piece of sort of practical advice you would give people listening around purposeful business. Um, how, can they, how can they deliver that more effectively? Or just one piece of advice if you had to choose um, to share. Scott, can I start with you? Yeah, thanks for not making me uh, name another book. That's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a starting point. Um, uh, I would say, uh, let me think, advice. I get stuck into the business impact invest, uh, assessment or, or on the B Corp side of things. If you really want to take a look at your whole business and just give, just give that a go uh, in a quiet couple of hours and have a play with that to see where you're sitting as a business now. And it will give you a good direction for, for the next few months. And it, it certainly helped us as a business. So have a go at that. Yeah, awesome. Uh, it's free to sign up. You can. You don't have to. Um, that's free to sign up, as Debbie mentioned earlier. Um, D- Debbie, what about you? I think just back on really on the back of my curiosity point, just reach out to people and ask some questions. Like over the course of Finisterre, we've literally asked some of the most ridiculous people. Like we just phoned up Patagonia in like year two and asked them how they did their photography because it was so good. And then people love it. People absolutely love it. You know, so just reach out to people, be human and interact as humans do, as opposed to as business people do for yourself. Awesome. Yeah. Lindsay. Yeah, I guess I, I'm sort of building on that one in, in terms of like just building community and making some friends. Uh, I think the the amazing thing about this, this kind of purpose driven business world is that everyone's really collaborative and wants to share and wants to learn from each other and like I know with us even within the ocean space the ocean's very big but the ocean conservation world's actually quite small um and if you are really really intentional in one thing only it's like just just connect and make friends with people and and be generous with your time and your knowledge and um and the same will come back to you awesome thank you and and Chris uh put your hand up it says a bit like Debbie but put your hand up and say help because two things happen then one lots of other people go oh, I was thought I was the only person who didn't know what that acronym meant or um, how to do that and the second thing is, is someone somewhere will say I think I can help you and that is our humanity and I do think that we have you know we have uh, and again it's Joe Cox the kind of murdered MP as she said you know we have far more common in common with each other than we have that divides us and mm. hold that dear in, in our hearts and just believe that there's more you know with everybody else is just waiting for some unlocking <laughs> we'll do yeah. this we absolutely will do this great awesome thank you um yeah really grateful for you giving your time today um debbie chris Lindsay, scott and also everyone in the audience really appreciate it it's, it's a beautiful afternoon so so do go and Go for a walk, go for a swim, go for a jump in the sea or or a bike ride and maybe just reflect on what we've been talking about. I'd love to connect with people more, as I'm sure the speakers would, if people want to continue the discussion. Um, And yeah, we've got a number of events coming up in the autumn through Low Carbon Devon. Um, Events like this, but also practical workshops in how to put some of this into action. Um, So we're exploring delivering some B Corp workshops but also carbon footprinting. So do keep an eye out on those. Um, we're having a break over August, but I'm I'm here and I'm really keen to chat with local organisations or just curious to chat if people have got ideas, suggestions, initiatives you're working on um, to connect with us. Um, always keen for a chat. And just another really thank you from me. Thank you for, to my colleague Hayley um, in the background. But also maybe we could just finish from three words from each of our speakers. Um, One little test, three words to leave us with. 
um, to describe the type of world you want to live in in 20 years time. So Scott, can we start with you again? Friendly, green and sunny. <laughs> awesome, yeah, Lindsay? Oh man, um, regenerative, kind and playful. Awesome, uh, Debbie? Uh, good, oh, this is Robert, uh, good outweighs bad. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And Chris. Uh, happy, inclusive, beautiful. 